the you tube page also has archived stuff there as well of our teachings so i'm looking at james chapter three beginning at verse number thirteen is our text this morning down to verse number eighteen and it says this who is a wise and understanding among you let them show up by their good life by deeds done in humility that comes from wisdom but if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts do not boast about it or deny the truth such wisdom does not come down from heaven but is earthly unspiritual demonic for where you have envy and selfish ambition there you find disorder in every evil practice but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure then peace loving considerate submissive full of mercy and good fruit impartial and sincere peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness harvey you've got a great radio voice come up here pray god's blessing on this word this morning as we get ready to receive from the holy spirit this morning how do you know harvey has a good radio voice yeah. in fact, he used to do those kinds of things back in the day pray god's blessing on our teaching this morning if you would harvey lord we just pray to you and we bless you we magnify your holy holy estate lord in the throne room the seraphim pray holy 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 lord god of hosts yes he who Amen. was he who is and he who is to come <laughs> and lord this morning you are come Amen. you are here yes. you bless this place Amen. we are blessed yes. and we know Thank your you presence Jesus. with us in that lord in that we pray you Hallelujah. and give you blessing 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 Amen. Thank you, Harvey. Somebody ought to give him a hand clap. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God. Thank you both, Harvey and Marilyn. We love you. Appreciate you guys. Love you too, Bless you so very much. Again, the series is entitled James, Faith in Action. The message this morning is entitled Wisdom from Heaven. Verses 13 through 18 is our text, which we read just a moment ago. And if I were to ask you this question... Hopefully I will get a good response, and hopefully some of you will have the right answer, and that's this. According to the Bible, who is the wisest person that has lived here on earth? Solomon. Very good. You all get an A. That said Solomon, because that's exactly right. Solomon is. Interesting to me that Solomon, who wrote much of the wisdom literature, is designated as the wisest man on planet Earth. But how many of you know you can be wise and still and be stupid? stupid yeah. Yeah. Or do stupid things. How's that? Yeah. yeah, let's do that better. Do stupid things. Here you have a guy who marries 700 wives, has 300 concubines, that's 1,000. I mean, you know, that's a nightmare right there. And one of the things that we learned from the Bible is this, is that Solomon was attracted by his wives to follow other gods. Now, Paul writes in the New Testament, he says that we're not to be unequally what, everybody? Yoked. yoked. To be unequally yoked is to be married to an unbeliever. Mm -hmm. And I even teach this. Sometimes unequally yoked is maybe somebody who is spirit-filled married to somebody who is not spirit filled and I know I'm sure I'll get all kinds of hate mail for that but it doesn't matter I've been around too long I've seen too much I've counseled way too many people to know that there's already enough conflict in marriage you don't need to add to it how few married folks can say amen to that yeah. I'm not prophesying any negativity over you I just have been married for 42 years some of you have been married at least that long maybe longer you know what I'm talking about it's not always a bed of roses. Why you have two different people, two different upbringings, two different backgrounds, two, two different ways of approaching things, learning to mesh that together. It takes time. So you've got to work through that. Now you, you have just one person, but now you've got this guy who's the wisest man in the world, and he makes a huge mistake by marrying all these women for advantageous political alliance reasoning which is still a stupid thing to do, and then has 300 concubines beside. That's a 1,000 women. He could not sleep with everyone an entire year. It would take multiple years to, to be with each one just one night out of a year. So because of that, he didn't practice what he preached. Now, he believed certain things, and he was wise in many areas, and he was used by the Holy Spirit under inspiration to write some great things, but he still did some really stupid stuff. 
Go with me to the book of Proverbs chapter 4. And we're going to start off our teaching this morning by looking at the book of Proverbs. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I've even learned how to memorize the books of the Bible. And so we're going to go to the book of Psalms and then Proverbs. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. I don't even know where it is. I can't even find it in my Bible. <laughs> where is it after? Oh yeah, there you go. Thank you. Between Genesis Ooh. and Revelation. Get nervous there for a moment. <laughs> <laughs> Proverbs chapter 4, starting at verse number 1. Here we go. Here's what it says. Listen, my sons or daughters. Look at somebody say son or daughter. Say so he's talking to you right now. Yeah. He's talking to me right now. He's talking to us right now. He says, listen, my sons, to a father's instruction. Pay attention and gain understanding. How do you know I want understanding? I give you sound learning, so do not forsake my teaching, for I too was a son to my father, still tender and cherished by my mother. How many of you know his daddy was David, his mother was Bathsheba? That's a story in and of itself we don't have time to talk about today. Amen. Major mistake that God redeemed and turned around. Can you praise the Lord for that? Verse number four says, Then he taught me and said to me, Take hold of my words with all of your what? Now another passage says, Guard your heart. Because from it, it is the wellspring of life. Everything flows from your heart. Right. The heart is the deep-seated part of you. It's the spirit part, if you will. We're a tripart being, created in the image of God. We have a spirit, we have a soul, and we have a body. Well, that heart of you is that which represents that spirit man, spirit woman, that relates to God. And he says, guard it. Yes. Because it's the wellspring. That means everything right. flows spirit. from it. Yes. Going on in the text, he then says this. Keep my commands and you will live. Get wisdom. Here it is. Get understanding. Do not forget my words or turn away from them. Do not forsake wisdom and she will note this. Do what? Protect you. Love her and she will what? Watch over you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Though it costs you all you have, get understanding. Cherish, which means to ingratiate, to love, and to lavish her. And she will exalt you. Embrace her and she will note this. Honor you. She will give you a garland to grace your head and present you with a glorious crown. I could go on and on about wisdom throughout the book of Proverbs, but we wouldn't have time to teach then from the book of James. I'm just setting the stage at the very beginning by saying this. Solomon, who is the wisest man in the world, is communicating to his son. We can apply it to daughters. We can apply it to all believers to get wisdom. It's the principal thing. Whatever it costs us, we must get it. And so we're going back now to our teaching from James. And my text this morning is found in verses 13 through 18. My teaching is entitled, Wisdom from where? Heaven. That means it's God-given. The wisdom that's being communicated here by James is wisdom that is from heaven. It's from God. And so as we look at this this morning, in James chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, I have three points that I want to talk about this morning. If you're taking notes, the first is this. That is, we, uh, let me just say this by way of introduction. Let me get this out of the way. If we want wisdom from heaven, we'll need to do what? Observe and do the following. There are some things we're going to have to look at and then once we've looked at them, we've inculcated them, we've assimilated them, then we're going to have to do them. Now, I like to eat. I don't know about you, but there are certain foods that I really like. You know, and uh, if you were to ask my wife, she could tell you what those foods are. I got to have Mexican food about once a week, somewhere in the, in, in the mix. I don't know if that's because I'm half Mexican or not. I don't know, but, but I, like, I love Mexican food. I like Chinese food. I even like East Indian food. Sunil is not here today. He and he and Heather are the, at home. They got a cold, and so they texted and said they weren't here today. But I, I tell Sunil, man, Sunil, you got to invite me over. And they're watching live on, on Facebook now. And I said, you got to invite me over because I like East Indian food. Now, my wife, she's not so much a fan, but I am. So what I would do is when I would take out people for lunch, I would take them like you, Joseph, and we would go to an East Indian place. Why? Because I like it. So if I like it, you're stuck with me if you're going to me. You get what I want because I'm paying and that's where we're going. Okay? So I like that. I like Chinese food. My wife, again, not so much on Chinese food, but I like it. And I use the sticks. I mean, we've been to China a number of times, so i got to stay in practice, and I eat with the sticks and everything else. There are certain things that I like. And my pastor, the host that usually pastors 
not usually pastors, he is the pastor in, in Hong Kong that we visit, and he's one of our contacts there. Pastor Amos saying he knows that when I come, when we go to the restaurant, we'll go to all different kinds of restaurants yeah, in go. Hong Kong. And they're a cool place to go to. A lot of Chinese people eat out because it's really cheap, even in, 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 in China. It's always on the second floor. You walk into the main level, you take an escalator up or stairs up, depending on the size of the restaurant. Huge. You walk in, there's a fish place and all kinds of fish that you can pick from, and you can eat and all kinds of animals that are in the fish thing. They're alive. They're swimming around in an aquarium. And, uh, and then you walk in, and they have a menu. Of course, I can't read it because I don't read Chinese, all the Chinese characters, and he starts he starts picking things off that. But he knows, uh, Pastor John, Pastor John, he like, he like uh, barbecue pork. He says BBQ pork. He says, Pastor John, he like BBQ pork, and he like, uh, he like bok choy with uh, lobster sauce. And I do. It was, man. He knows what I I like. So he orders for Pastor John. One of my favorites, if you ever get to go to China, well, you can even maybe find a place here in America to do this. It's called Hot Pot. It's kind of a cool thing. And by the way, today's Sunday, right? You know what's going on in China today on Sundays? You know what their big deal is? It's it's called dim sum. Dim sum is big in China on Sundays. They eat it on Sundays. They make up these things. They're in steam pots. They're kind of doughy things filled with meat or whatever, all kinds of stuff. It's a dim sum day in China. That's a big deal there. Okay, and so I'm not so much on dough balls filled meat. I, I like <laughs> other stuff, but I like hot pot. Now, hot pot, what they do is they bring out. They have this thing that comes up in the middle of your table, and it's filled with boiling water. And they're boiling water, and then they start bringing out shrimp with its antenna still on, its eyeball still intact, <laughs> and then you throw it in there. They bring out different veggies that you throw in there, different kinds of meat, and you start throwing it in there, and it boils and it boils. And then what you do is you start pulling out of that, and they'll bring you rice of course and rice they have it you, you bring it in a bowl and you can eat it with your chopsticks that's why you hold it up here like this but then you start putting on your plate that cooked stuff the shrimp and the beef and the chicken or whatever's boiling in the pot the veggies or whatever and you start putting on your plate and you eat some rice you eat some of that and then when it's done you pour the soup in a bowl and you drink it at the end it's awesome i love hot pot it's a whole experience that goes along with that but my point is this, is that when we eat, we eat and we assimilate that which we eat. It becomes a part of us. It's what gives us the nutrients and the calories that are necessary and needed to sustain life. That which is the draught, if you will, goes out and is eliminated and the rest helps us stay viable and alive. Okay? In the same way, the food, which is the Word of God, is like that. We yes. eat it, we assimilate it, it goes on the inside of us. Yes. My sister here told me this morning, she says, we remember, two weeks ago we were talking about the message that you preached. And you says, you don't have to remember all of it, just remember parts of it and talk about it because then you will begin to live that out and do that. Amen. Listen, I know that I spew a lot of stuff in a message. I communicate a lot of stuff in a very fast manner. It's how I preach. It's how I teach. And I don't expect you to remember it all. But I do. It is my hope. It is my desire that you will take at least one or two things that are takeaways that you're able to take with you and put into practice that following oh, week good. and then at some point in time in your life. So having said that, point number one, now let's get back to this, is the evidence of a wise and understanding person found in verse 13. I'll read it again, and then we'll develop it. Here's what it says. Who of you is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by, note this, their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. Three bullet points. The first is this, show by their good life. If you are a wise and understanding person, the fruit of it, the evidence of it is going to be this. You're going to show it by your good life, how you live you and characterize this? yourself. Yeah. That at some point in time, the teaching of the Word of God is so actualized in your life that you begin to live that out. Your treatment of one another, your treatment of other people, how you carry yourself, how you conduct yourself in everyday life. Here's a quote, and it says this, Let him, by a holy and chaste conversation, show through meekness and gentleness, join to this divine information that he is a Christian indeed. So it's living out your life oh, that's pleasing to the Lord. Amen. The people Amen. can see that, that it's exemplified in how you teach them. Bullet point two, it's shown by their deeds. This means actual actions. So you're living... What you're believing. Everybody say, living, living. what I believe. I believe. <laughs> now, didn't he say that already in James 1? 
Yeah. He says that we then don't forget what we do, but the blessed ones put into practice that which they have heard. James 1, 25. They do it. It's the doers that become blessed. It's not the hearers. All the hearing is important because that's how you get faith. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 17, right? So you got to hear because that builds your faith. Yes, and then remember what I've said faith. often. Faith is acting on what you believe. Yes. Hebrews 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. That means you're activating that which you heard by living it out. It's called faith. Hallelujah. Now we know from Habakkuk, we know from Romans, that faith, this whole Christian life is from faith first to last. Okay? The just shall live by faith. faith. That's what that's what that's what was Martin Luther's whole tenet of his separation from the Catholic Church and how he went from the Catholic Church to the Reformation, the Protestant Reformation, was all that the just shall live by faith and that the priesthood of all believers. There wasn't some second class citizen because you weren't a priest, but we're all one in Christ. Can you say amen? amen. But then the just shall live by faith, amen. not by their deeds. The deeds are the outflowing of the fact that you do have faith. And that's what James is communicating to these scattered tribes of people all over the known world at that particular time. Right. To the Jewish Christians and then also Gentiles as well. He's saying, listen, it's by your deeds that are the evidence of the fruit of a good life. So, so we see deeds here. It's the works and his spirit proving that God is with him in truth and that from the fullness of a holy heart, his feet walk, his hands work, and his tongue speaks. That means that we do this where the rubber hits the road in everyday life. Yep. It's by our deeds. It's by our action. It's the overflow. But the attitude is huge here. It's done how? In what, everybody? Humility. Everybody say humility. humility. Okay. The word there, then, is a byproduct of meekness. I think King James may even see the word meekness. Now, the word in the Greek is the word praeotis. Not praying mantis, but praeotis. Okay. Praeotis means this. Here's the definition. Are you ready? Yes. Strength under control. There you go. Wow. Meekness is not weakness. No. People often associate meekness with weakness. It's not. Meekness is strength under control. When you read anybody, Kenny Boyles, any Greek scholar, Dr. Bob Butler, anybody that elaborates on that particular word praeotis in the Greek, it literally is the connotation of a great stallion that has been broken. Now its will is not broken. It's just been broken so that it can be ridden and it can be mastered by the one who sits on it. You all heard me talk about my father who I just saw in Seattle. I was just up there with him for the last week. I had to go up there. We kind of made an emergency. Of, I made an emergency visit. He needed some assistance with the family he's staying with. And so I was privileged to go be with my dad and spend time with him and be there and help him go to an appointment and just be there with him and his wife, Grace, and spend time with them. But my dad was a jockey. My dad never weighed over 110 pounds till he was about 20, I think it was 29 years of age. Can you imagine that? Never weighed over that. So when I graduated from college, I weighed 110 pounds. And then in my, no, excuse me, 120 pounds. I weighed 120 pounds. And then when I came to college, after my first year of college, eating college food, I weighed 140 pounds. <laughs> A lot of starch in that food. Eating 10 pounds after you got married, too. Yeah. Then when I got married, yeah. But anyway, it's like telling you what I weigh now. It's between me and God, all right? But it's not what I used to be. I'm still better than I used to be. So anyway, the point is this, is that Pops... My dad, he had to train. I've, I've asked him, because my dad was a boxer. He was the boxing coach of the town I grew up in. And I said, Dad, of everything that you've done physically, what's the hardest thing you've had to train for? You know what he said? Riding a horse. Can you, be a, can you imagine being a 110 guy, 110 pound guy, sitting on a horse, and your legs are like this throughout the entire race? Yeah. You're in the stirrups like this. 
The, the saddle is little dinky saddle, and you're riding that, and you're you're directing that horse with your knees, your neck reining that horse, and you've got the whip going. I mean, there's a whole lot of stuff going on that you don't see when that jockey's riding that horse, and the gate opens, and the bell rings, and out the gate they go. It is pretty amazing. He says, I had to be in the best condition to be able to ride that horse. I don't know what does a horse weigh, a, couple, a ton or something like that. Yeah. You're on it. You're on that horse and having to direct it around that, navigate traffic, and, and go through the crowd and all of that. He says, that's the most difficult thing that I've had to do physiologically to be in shape. So I bring that up to say, that's what preyotis means. Strength under control. Meekness is not weakness. So that when we live the good life, that our deeds are being done as unto the Lord. All of that is with the attitude of humility. Now don't mistake confidence for cockiness. Some people are confident and they're still humble. Some people are just plain cocky. Okay? There's a difference there. I think you ought to be confident. I think I ought to be confident. We ought to project a confidence that you can be humble and confident at the same time. Because whatever you have done, whatever you have learned, God's given you that ability to do what you do. Write this scripture down. I love it. It's Deuteronomy 8.18. It says this. It's the Lord. Everybody say, it's the Lord. Who's given you the ability to get wealth to establish his covenant among the nations. I was talking with somebody just this past week. This person has had the privilege of being in Jeff Bezos' home. He's, he's been in Gates' home, both Bill and Melinda. They're married in their homes. Uh, heads of Microsoft, heads of Google, heads of Amazon, heads of other con- uh, other major companies that are in existence. The top, the top, I mean, m- billionaires that have the most amount of money of anybody in the world. He's been in their homes multiple times in his, his business. And one of the things that he says is that they project or exude a certain confidence. Paul Allen. I mean, I can go on and on different ones. Now, how many of you know, again, confidence doesn't have to be cocky. Confidence can be humility. And I really believe that God wants us to be sure, us to be sure about who we are in him. Amen. And so as a result of that, that as Amen. we do our good deeds, as we then living a good life, are doing it with an attitude of humility that at the end of the day, all glory goes to God because whatever I have that's good is from Him. Can you say amen? Amen. Point number one. Point number two is that we get to avoid carnal wisdom and its fruits. Take a look, if you would, please, now at verses 14 through 16. But if you harbor bitter envy, if you harbor... You know what it means to come into harbor with a boat? You bring a boat in, you harbor it, you dry dock it, you leave it there, you tie it up, you moor it there. That's what it means to come into the harbor. It's like a boat. It's from ship terminology. If you harbor what? Bitter envy in your heart. Guess what it's going to do to your heart? It's going to ruin it. It's going to contaminate it. You ever had an apple? You heard the song, Bad Apple Don't Spoil the Whole Bunch of Girl? Well, it does if you leave it in there too long. Yeah. You start getting a rotten apple, it starts contaminating yeah, the other parts. Yeah. Did not the Apostle Paul say in the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, when he wrote the church at Corinth, he says, listen, you guys, you are tolerating a sinner in your body that's getting all over the church world, and you need to deal with that guy because it's going to contaminate. He says, don't you know that leaven will leaven the whole oh, lump? lump. Yeah. It's the same thing. Thing. A bad apple will ultimately spoil the whole apple. Yeah. It's going to affect that. So when Paul is addressing, he says, you've got to deal with that guy. He says, I've already judged him, and you need to deal with him too. You need to you need to judge him, and you need to correct him. And if he's unwilling to be corrected, then you need to throw him out of the fellowship. Now, we don't hear that anymore, do we, in our, in our teaching anymore. No, no, Nobody does that kind of stuff. Well, for one thing, they might sue you. Because everybody's so sue happy. Yeah. But nobody have the nobody has the guts to do that. In some cases, it might be the the most uh, wealthiest donor giving to the church. Well, we wouldn't want to upset that apple cart. Hey, listen, we've got to deal with sin. We cannot be so tied to money or a monetary thing Amen. that it's going to compromise us preaching Amen. the truth. Amen. Listen, if you're driven by money, then you're driven by the wrong thing. If you're afraid you're going to lose a congregant because they're in known sin, it's one thing to fail in sin and to be repentant. 
It's another thing to sin and be flagrant about it and not deal with it and everybody know about it and not be dealt with about it. You, you see what I'm saying? There's a difference there. We're not running around pointing out people's sins. Thank God that the Holy Spirit deals with us and we repent and we get on and we forgive. Amen? Are you, are you hearing with me? But when somebody's in flagrant sin and they're unwilling to repent, man, that is a responsibility of the shepherd to go and to say, listen, you need to knock this off. I can tell you stories of I don't have time for that today. Don't have time. I just don't have time. Yeah, it's too many stories. Avoid carnal wisdom, and it's true. So going on, he says this. I better finish reading the text, and then we can develop it. Here's what he says. He says, selfish ambition in your hearts. Do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is, note this. It's not wisdom from heaven. It's this kind of wisdom, earthly, unspiritual, demonic. For where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder in every True. evil practice. Yeah. Carnal wisdom is, first of all, earthly. Some of your versions may even say sensual. Okay, And so as a result of that, it's yeah. having this life only in view. That's what earthly kind of wisdom is. It's only having this life in view. How many of there's more than this life? Oh, yeah. In fact, the unseen realm is more real than the seen realm. That's right. That's right. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean it's not there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Now, those that have a seer anointing yeah. on their life, they've been able to see into that realm yeah. with great regularity and praise God for that. The rest of us, we just got to walk and take it by faith. <laughs> yeah, that's <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm that kind of guy. I've never. I've only had one trip that I ever remember of seeing heaven in in my lifetime that I know of. I've never seen angels, although I believe there are angels. I believe there's all kinds and sizes and shapes of angels. Angels, seraphim, cherubim. Okay, yeah. and they have different yeah. complexion, all kinds of things. I haven't seen them, but I know they're there. Yeah. That's right. I live by faith. I walk by faith, so I know because the Bible teaches it they're around. Yeah. In fact, they're here today. Yep, they were. I believe they the are. angels are here joining yeah. us in yeah. joyful assembly and worshiping yeah. with us. Yeah. Come on, somebody! I believe angels are assigned to you. They're assigned to me. They're assigned to you. Yeah. They're assigned to you. I believe angels are even assigned over church bodies. And yep. so I thank God for the angels that He sent us. And by the way, we don't command angels, but we ask the Father in Jesus' name yeah. in this space dispatch angels on our behalf to provide care, to provide uh, whatever is necessary to bring the resources to us that will help advance the cause of Christ and the kingdom of God. Yeah. So I will say before you as the federal head of this church body by the Lord Jesus Christ, not because I promoted myself, but because of Jesus Christ, I say, Lord, we invite your angelic host to come to assist us, yeah. not only in this meeting today, yeah. but in the yeah. days ahead, the months ahead, the years yeah. ahead. So should you tarry, that they will release the anointing of God upon this body, the yeah. blessing of God to bring people, to bring resources, to bring gifts, talents, and abilities that belong to this house, hold that it would flourish yes. to advance the cause of Christ in the greater Eugene Springfield amen. state of Oregon in the United States of America and the world. Can you agree with that? Say amen. 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 Hallelujah. So he says this wisdom is earthly. It's, it's carnal. It's also unspiritual. This is the word that's actually sensual in some versions. And it means this. It means an animal having for its object the gratification of the pass and pass passions it's like an animal, like a dog, having for its object the gratification, gratification of the passions and animal propensities. I've known animals will do things in the street that 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 yeah. humans would, should never think about doing. Yeah. If you know what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, even just you know, they're sometimes they run around scrounging for food. They're like all you know. When I was in the Philippines. Uh, I would see these street dogs running all over. You've seen them, Harvey. Street dogs running around in the city of Manila. I mean, they're in all the cities. I was in Mindanao and whatever, and up in the highlands with different places. But but I remember in the Philippines, I'd be walking around. I said, what are these dogs? Who owns these dogs? Oh, they're just street dogs. They call them Ascal. Ascal is a street dog. And so I go, oh, there's an Ascal. There's an Ascal. There's an Ascal. And they're street dogs. And they just do things that they're looking for food. Some are emaciated. They're flea-ridden. I mean, they don't have any hair because they're scratching like crazy. And they're looking for their next meal. They're just animals. And he's saying, in essence, he says, that's exactly what we're talking about here. It's unspiritual. Or it's a sensual kind of instinct. It's the bad kind of wisdom. He also says that it's demonic in its origin. It means it's demonically inspired by demons and maintained in their soul by the indwelling influence. So whatever that happens is that the wisdom that comes is actually prompted by demons to influence people. Mm -hmm. So wow. it says That's right what's there. Going on right now. That sounds like 
Democrat. Yeah, it does sound a lot like what's happening in America right now. I mean, this election is the most ravis, ravis, ravenous that I've ever seen. I'm saying, where is that coming from? i got to tell you, if you have any wits about you and spiritual sensibility, you know that's demonic. You heard me wax eloquent. Better take a drink. Last week, about abortion and all things related to that. I mean... I honestly don't know as a believer how you can vote for a particular party because of the party platform. That's right. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. I don't know. I just don't know. Okay. I'll leave it at that. And I hope you're registered to vote. And when you vote, I hope you vote the Bible. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. The person yeah. that's standing for the word of God. Good words. Morality. Good word. yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, thank you. So what ends up happening, and the fruit of the carnal wisdom is what? Two things, bitter envy and selfish ambition. Bitter envy and selfish ambition. So what ends up happening is a person will manipulate a situation because they're envious of somebody else. I'm, 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 I'm selfish. They have selfish ambition. They want this. They don't have it. So they're going to do what they can do to connive and to maneuver to get that. Because it's all about them. It is. It is all about them. And so he's saying, that is carnal wisdom. It becomes the fruit of it. And the results are these two things. Disorder and every evil practice. Wow. Disorder. That means confusion. Things out of order. Okay. And then also, not only is it that, but it's every evil practice. Lying. Cheating, yes. maneuvering yes. to get your way. Yeah. I'm going through that, Pastor. Okay? That's what that's representative yes. of. That's yeah. point number two. He says, avoid carnal wisdom and its fruit. Mm -hmm. Number three, and this is the good stuff. We like this. It's this, is that we get to embrace heavenly wisdom. Now, when you embrace something, what do you do? You uh, take it in. Yeah. Now, how do you know there's a difference between a hug and embrace? Yeah. Tell yeah. me. This is kind of like a hug. But when I embrace my wife, she wants me to really snuggle her good. Squeeze. Grab her, pull her in tight. Okay. Amen. That's an embrace. That's what she likes. Do you know, this is just a side note, but it fits here, that the Greek word for worship in the New Testament is the Greek word proskuneo. Okay? Here's what it means. It means this, to move forward as if to kiss. But how do you know when you kiss really good, you've got to embrace when you kiss? And that's the same connotation. You've got to embrace heavenly wisdom. Isn't that the very same thing that we started our message with? Get wisdom. Get understanding. Though it costs you all you have, get it. And here's the things that it's going to do for you. All right. So we have a whole number of things that wisdom, heavenly wisdom, does. First of all, let's take a look here. The wisdom that comes from heaven is, first of all, pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy, and good fruit, impartial, and sincere. It's all of those things. So he says, embrace it. Why? Because it's pure. This purity is the reference. It's not to sexual purity, but to the absence of any sinful attitude or motive. How many of you know we've got to check our motives? Because yeah, sometimes our motives are impure. What is this going to do for me versus I'm doing this out of true a true heart? Now, you know, agape love does it with expecting nothing in return. And that's the attitude that needs to happen here. He says, that's the reason that I'm wanting this kind of wisdom because it's, first of all, it's pure. It's not mixed. Okay. Now, how do you know, as you look at different rings, like I can take off, this is my wedding ring. I've had this for... Uh, over 42 years. Let's see, we were engaged. How long before we got married? We were engaged like six months or something. I think we got, when did we get married? My wife says, honey, are you going to, she actually said to me, are we, are you going to marry me or not? Because if you're not, I'm going to, I'm going to find somebody else. She says, you know, you better cut bait or fish. One of the two, because I'm out of here. For now. So, okay. I said, so you know what happened that Saturday morning? We went down to Harry, Harry Ritchie's downtown Eugene. We bought her engagement ring. She still has it on her finger. And she's had a few other rings since then that we've gotten her. She likes rings. But anyway, uh, anyway, so we got her a, a diamond ring, nice big old ring that stands out with a big old diamond on it. 
And so that was what she got, and then I got this, and so we've had them. But how do you know when you look at the rings, it has on it the carrots, how much carrot gold it is. Yeah. The more carrots, the more gold is in it, yeah, the pure it pure. is. Yeah. Now, I grew up in the Black Hills of South Dakota. If you've ever heard of the Black Hills, there's a mine there that's called the Homestake Mine. It's where Black Hills gold comes from. Lead in Deadwood, South Dakota, very famous and that's where Black Hills Gold comes from. It's a unique kind of gold. It's like two different shades. I used to have a bunch of it. I have, in fact, a ring that I got for my graduation. I usually wear it on this hand when I wear it. But it's got Black Hills Gold. It's a ring my mom and dad gave me for college graduation. And so it's a reminder, a memento of that fact. But it's got a certain amount of gold in it. And usually it's very soft gold. So it's got a lot of gold content in it. But the more carrots, the more that it's pure. And so what we're saying is, is to us, that wisdom that is from above, that's heavenly, that's God-given, is pure. Yes. Amen. It's not additives to it. Even your gas, if you read on the pump, 10% ethanol. Okay, you read that? That's a corn. Thank you. Exactly. That's exactly like I said. It's like corn. You know, they grow corn and they mix it and they play anyway. The juice goes in there. All right. So it's pure. It's also, it's peace loving. Did you ever think we'd run on corn? You know, you're driving down the road. You know, maybe it's like uh, Mr. Haney or something or the Clampets or whatever. All right. It's peace loving. In the Septuagint, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. It is used mostly of God's disposition as a king. And as a king, guess what? He is gentle and he is kind. Oftentimes people picture God is this mean ogre up there waiting to squash you like a bug. That's a legalistic mindset. That's not who God is. He is a gentle and kind king. God is for you. He's not against you. Amen. We get to, we get to renew our minds regarding the fact that it's peace loving. That's what wisdom is. It, so if our father is like that, guess what? We're also needing to be like that. This kind of wisdom is considerate. It's not stubborn or obstinate. It's, it's got a yielding disposition in all things. And that's what that is. It's considerate of others. It's not just my way or the highway. Now, there are some things that it's got to be that way, okay? But, but we, can, we can be conciliatory. We can yield and we can bend. The next thing is, is this kind of wisdom is submissive. And it can be mean, easy to persuade. Not in the sense of being pliable and weak. Have you, know, you ever seen a submissive person? They just bend to anything. To anything. They're used to be. They just, he's not talking about that. He's talking about, but in the sense of not being stubborn and being willing to listen to reason and to appeal. You ever know somebody who's just stubborn, always stubborn, all the time? Lord, right here, my yeah. You know, so he said, that's not what we're talking about. But that they can be pliable, listen to reason and to appeal. This wisdom is also full of mercy. The wisdom knows that the same measure of mercy that we grant to others is the same mercy measure that God will use with us. And so we need to be people that are people of mercy. In fact, last week we read about mercy triumphs over judgment. I don't know about you, but I want to be judged by mercy. I don't want to be judged by the law. Mercy triumphs over judgment. It's full of good fruit. It isn't just the inner power to think and talk about things the right way. It's full of good fruits. It's not just like mind over matter. Mind over matter. Mind over matter. No, it's really fruit being produced as the overflow of a person that is tapped into the Holy Spirit. That's vibrant and alive. It's fruit bearing. I've often said Galatians 5, 22 and 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, yes. joy, peace, patience, Kindness, goodness, gentleness, mercy, self-control. Those are the fruits of the Spirit. Now, do you know the fruits are always born out of circumstance? It is. Mm -hmm. it does. The difference between gifts and fruits are this. Oh, yeah. Gifts are given. Yes. You don't do anything no. except receive it. Receive it. I mean, you know, that's we all have gifts that God's given us. You didn't work for those. God has freely given them to you. Okay. Now, a fruit is the outflow of your the roots of your life. That when you're faced with a situation, what do you do in the midst of that situation? How do you respond? How do you react? What do you say? Now, sometimes when you get tired, do you know you let your guard down? Yeah. You ever been tired and you said things, oh, man, that was a lousy yeah. thing yeah. to say. Yeah. That was really, yeah. that was bad. Yeah. And so that's why we, we need to be aware of our circumstances and what's going around us. I remember Bruce, uh, not Bruce, uh, Bob Larson. 
was going to say Bruce Larson, not Bruce Larson, but Bob Larson. Bob Larson's a friend of ours. We've known him for a number of years. He used to come to our church and minister and come to the city and minister. And so anyway, Bob, if you don't know him, he's big into deliverance ministry, hugely into deliverance ministry. And Bob made this statement. He says, you know what? Sometimes people are not demonized. They just need a meal because they're not thinking correctly. He says, sometimes they just need to eat something. They need some protein because they're not thinking correctly. And so they say things or do things that seem odd or weird. Just give them a good meal. And there are some people that don't think they're demonized. They probably are. (laughs) It's a whole other subject for another day. And, but anyway, so he says good fruit. And so we want good fruit. When I think of good fruit, I think of fruit that's ripened to the right point in time. Yeah. Uh-huh. You know, it's like a ripened right. apple. You're talking about, somebody's talking about, Harry, who was talking about apples a moment ago? Is that you? Yeah, you're talking about when you're teaching. Yeah. You're teaching. Like a great, golden, delicious apple at the right time. I mean, exactly. Those things that are like that, just sweet and full of yummy, juicy juice. It's impartial wisdom without impartiality or without judging. In essence, a curious inquiry into the faults of others to find matters for centuries. That's not what we're talking about. We're impartial, that we are looking at things wisely. And then finally, it's sincere. That's what we're talking about, wisdom. This means without pretending to be what it is not, acting always in its own character, never working under a mask. Because the word hypocrisy, hypocrisy is that very thing. It means to be masked. Yeah. Okay? That's what it means. It's wearing to be masked. Mask. Yeah, wearing a mask. Well, we're not talking about that. But wisdom is sincere. It's genuine. It's from, I mean, you can tell when somebody's faking it. Yeah. You've all heard fake it till you make it. Well, that, that may yeah, work in some sort of circumstance, but it's going to wear out after a while. Yeah. You have got to be the real you because the real you is going to break through at some point in time. Amen. It's going to be sincere and genuine. That's what true wisdom is. Amen. All right. I'm running out of time, both on the clock and in my teaching, so let's wrap this up. Go to the conclusion, if you would, please. Look at verse number 18. It is the last verse of our teaching this morning. It says, peacemakers who sow in peace. We talked about sowing today, didn't you, Joseph? Who sow in peace do what? They reap a harvest of righteousness. So if you're sowing in peace, the Greek word is irene. Okay, peace. If I'm, it's like the town constable who is bringing peace. Now, how many of some people don't want peace? But if you'll sow in peace, you will reap a harvest of righteousness. Hmm. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. Now, here's a quote from Poole. He says this, Matthew Poole. The fruit of righteousness, either the fruit we bring forth, which is righteousness itself. It's an outflow of our life, seen in Luke 3, 8, 9, Romans 6, 22, Philippians 1, 11, are the fruit we reap, which is the reward of our righteousness, which is eternal life. Amen. It is the fruit that I get, ultimately, of a righteous life seen in eternal life. Hallelujah. Now, I close with this. How many of you know, it's just a reminder, because it's good to repeat things. When you're saved, we call it justification, just as if I had never sinned. Is that right? Yes. You also receive the Holy Spirit. It's a deposit. It's the deposit guaranteeing the fullness of your salvation on the moment you die and go to be with Jesus or he comes for us. Okay? The second thing that happens in a believer's life is called sanctification. It's the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit in your life to produce in you the character we talked about here of a good life and good deeds done in humility. Okay, That is the Amen. sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. So hopefully that's working, being worked out in your life. Third thing is called glorification. Glorification is where you receive the fullness now of all that you've lived. You get eternity in its fullness. The moment, now this is my belief and it's my contention based off Psalms 139. This is why I'm so adamantly against abortion. David said about God, you knew me in my mother's womb. That's right. In other words, in my conception, you knew me. Now listen to me. If you're listening, you've had an abortion, it's not the unpardonable or the unforgivable sin. Maybe even ladies here have had abortion, and it's not the unpardonable, it's not the unforgivable sin. Recognize it for what it is. It is sin. 
and because of that jesus paid a price for sin you ask forgiveness and be set free from that sin are you hearing me but we need to take a staunch stand against that in that we would stand against that because it's murder in psalms 139 you knew me in my mother's womb all my days have been ordained for me and so as a result of that human life begins at conception it will never cease to exist that's right where it will exist at is either heaven or hell that's right. now we teach babies if they die or if they're aborted they go to heaven why because they don't have an understanding they can't make an intelligent decision or whether or not it's christ an agent of accountability do you know that according to the Jews that they become a man at 13 years of age? They go through a rite called a bar mitzvah or a bat mitzvah. So then that's where they become an adult at. They become accountable. They're no longer relying upon their parents. Now, I had an age of an accountability at five. I knew I was a sinner needed a savior. So it's different for everybody. But at that point, you now become accountable. That's right. And once you say yes to Jesus... And you then die, you go to be with him, and Amen. you receive what's called glorification. Amen. The fulfillment of that which is a down payment now becomes in its reality fully actualized in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 That's the good news Amen. that we as believers Amen. have. Look at somebody and say, You're in process. You're in process. Look at somebody else and say, I'm in process. I'm in process. So we're all in process. <laughs> And you know when your construction is over, the day you die and go be with Jesus, or he comes for you. That's when. So until then, we're still growing. We're still growing. Let's pray. And Joseph, if you just go click that off and that one off, that would be awesome. Father, thank you so very much today for your mercy, your goodness, and your grace.